do this uh, research department, ILO research department seminar on behind the AI curtain, the invisible workers powering AI development. Um, my name is Cher Verick. I'm head of the employment strategies unit here at the ILO, uh, and I'll be moderating today's session. And you'll hear shortly from Uma Rani, who's a senior economist, and Rishab Deer, who's research officer in the research department on this topic. But let me just start by saying a few words on, on, on the topic we're discussing today, which doesn't need a, a big introduction because these days we're all talking about AI. Um, but I want to just highlight three issues. Firstly, you may be wondering why somebody who deals with employment policies is, is here as moderator. And this is not just coincidence, it's, it's also to stress the importance of looking at these issues within a broader employment policy perspective. And, and the bigger picture on jobs and public policy. Uh, all countries around the world are grappling with the challenge of creating decent and productive employment. And for that reason, it's very important to ask the question, where does this fit in within that broader context? Uh, secondly, and linked to this, uh, as, as, as we see at the ILO, with many international organizations in the media around the world, there's a lot of focus on the implications of AI for labor markets and for jobs. And obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's still early days to see the actual outcomes, but there's a lot of discussion on what are the implications and efforts to estimate the likely impact, including by colleagues here at the ILO. But of course, this is very much focusing on the deployment of AI, but there's another side to it, as we'll hear today, it's on the development of AI. And there it's critical to look at also those implications for decent employment. Now, finally, I just, you know, in this context, broader context, but also looking at not just the deployment, but development, it's, it is critical to look at the, these issues from multiple angles. Um, there's obviously, you know, opportunities that are being created, but at the same time, risks, risks in terms of the type of work that's being generated, the quality of those jobs. Um, and so it's very important to see that balance and that picture, looking at both the opportunities and the risks and challenges. And today we are very much going to hear about uh, some of these aspects from, from both Uma and, and uh, Rishab in terms of that, de that development side, but also those risks and some of those challenges to the quest for creating decent jobs. So on that note, I'm now going to hand it over to, to Uma and Rishab uh, for 40 minutes, let's say, uh, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Um, as usual, you have the opportunity to put the questions in the chat. And for the large numbers of people in the room, you can also raise your hands when we come to the Q&A session. But uh, let's just now move to the presentation itself. Over to you, Uma. Thank you, uh, Cher. And I'm going to just jump into the presentation because uh, Cher has, in some sense, set the scene for us. So what Rishabh and I are going to talk to you about today is behind the AI curtain, the invisible workers powering AI development. I'm sure many of you have heard about it, about AI development, but what we thought of doing is tell you a story around how there are different types of AI tools that are available today in the market and what does AI development actually mean in reality. So uh, let me start by saying that there's been a lot of advances over the past decade and a half or two decades with digital technologies, computing power, and AI. So there's been a reinvigoration uh, with regard to concerns that are there about automation for jobs and labor market. 10 years ago, we had this famous Frey and Osborne study, which went about talking on automation, robotization, and how it impacts on jobs. And today we see a similar narrative coming in with AI. And there's some bit of busting that is happening, but I think we need to even really look behind that AI to understand what is this AI revolution that we are saying. So there's also claims of an AI driven transition to a post work world and which has actually resulted in a lot of AI focused startups that have come up with the hope to automate jobs. Now, how do these AI startups actually come up? That's largely because since the dot-com bust that we have seen of 2000s and the fi financial crisis of 2008, 
you see a lot of venture capital investment actually going into two things. One is the rise of platforms. And the second thing that you see is the rise of AI startups. And AI startups are largely those who are actually providing a number of tools as products or number of tools for services or for managing a number of other uh, workflow management within the firms. Now, the narrative or the discourse is also being increasingly challenged by the researchers. And the questions that are being asked is, what is being portrayed as AI? Is it really AI? And that is a point which is under scrutiny and being questioned also in our presentation today. And the second thing that is being done is there's a lot of highlights almost for a decade now about the growing reliance of the AI industry on invisible and precarious workers and how this entire AI works in human in the loop. Now, all of this has led to an emergence of AI-enabled business models, which has led to the development of new AI tools, products, and services. Now, let me take a few minutes to talk to you about what a development of AI means and what do we mean by invisible workers within the process. Now, colleagues at Dip Lab have been doing extraordinary work around the entire lang large language learning models, trying to understand what goes into it. And this is years of work that's been done both on platforms as well as BPOs in a number of countries, largely in Africa, but also in Latin America. And what you see clearly is there are very clearly three functions that are there as a part of the development of AI. One is preparation of AI, which requires data generation and annotation of data. Then there's a whole modeling process that is undertaken by largely software programmers or coders. And much of this data is actually fed into those models to see how it could be run. And then you have the AI verification where all that comes out is further verified. Now, all of these processes, the data generation, data annotation, and the verification process is where you have a number of invisible workers that are actually engaged in it. Now, this is one of the companies which is quite a top company that you have, which looks, which provides AI services. And I'm going to just run through what the life cycle of AI services is for this particular company. And they say that we provide AI data solutions in a whole range. You can see generative AI to, you know, autonomous vehicles to social media, personalization, search engines, sentiment analysis, you name it, it's there, including e-commerce. Now, what is in the core of the AI lifecycle services? It is a use case of raw data. And a lot of this raw data is what is actually generated by the invisible workers, either in the platforms or on in BPO companies, according to the instructions that are being provided by the companies or by the clients. So this is a custom data collection, which is pre-labeled data sets, and that gets into what is called as in a very synthetic way data. Then you have data preparation stage, where you have classification, annotation, transcription, translations that happen. And then you feed that into the model and that's where the whole testing evaluation happens. Uh, this might all look uh, strange and it might look very theoretical, but we are gonna give you some very clear practical examples as we go by. So what the platform also tries to advertise when it tries to say that you're providing services is we have capabilities around image and video annotation. We have, uh, you know, we can, text annotation, we can test them, we can do almost everything. And they can do it in a number of languages. And how does that entire process work? The entire process works through a global delivery model, which is either the crowd workers or the microtaskers of the app and platform, or it has a small secure workforce, who are the programmers who actually program the model within the company, but a lot of it is also outsourced. And they have 
client internal teams. It's a very sophisticated word or term for saying simply it's a call center or a business process outsourcing company, frankly. So what they do at Appen is they have a global crowd of about 1 million plus workers from about 170 countries who speak about 290 languages. And they're very proud in saying that our crowd consists of students, professionals, parents, free labor, largely unused labor that's sitting around, PhDs, veterans, educators, and gamers. So they engage almost everybody within the labor market, outside the labor market, to basically ensure that this work actually goes on. Now, if you look at the AI market, the tools market, and there are lots more that are there, frankly, but what we are gonna to present to you is largely based on our research and research that we have seen that was published from other colleagues uh, who have been also doing intensely. And we're gonna show you four areas or four different types of AI tools that are operating today in the market. And we'll show you how much AI is there and how much of human in the loop is there. The first is the AI systems for Web 2.0 and other industries. Like, you know, you get onto an e-commerce platform today, everything is well, very well organized, right? You get onto an Amazon shop, everything is super well done. And you looking for a trouser or a blouse, or looking for a purse, you're like, oh, wow, I can just click these words and they come up and you get everything. And you think it's an algorithm that is doing it. But no, that's where the human invisible labor comes in and they do it. So they do a lot of categorizing, tagging, a lot of annotation tasks, which is done in driverless cars. There's a lot of content moderation that happens. So, you know, when you get onto the web, you don't see any pornographic images or hate speeches, and you think, oh, all that is being sieved out from the Web 2.0 because it's super powerful, Cloud Computing 5, you know, it can do everything, but it's actually not. It's actually workers on platforms or in BPO companies in developing countries who sieve through thousands of pornographic images every day and then decide what goes on to the web and what does not go onto the web. The second area is AI-driven products such as robot vacuum cleaners. I don't know how many of you use it here or online, but you would be very surprised to see how much of AI is built in it. Not only that, how much of invisible workers are behind it. The third is virtual assistance for secretarial services, which has grown phenomenally over the last decade. And it's pretty shocking to see how much actually operates in human in a loop. And the final one is the automated surveillance and security systems, which are used largely in supermarkets, houses, and in a number of other places. And we'll see how much of AI is actually behind it. And with that, I'm gonna give it to my colleague who's gonna run you through some of the types of AI tools and I'll take it from him later. Thank you, Uma. So along with you, we will now start excavating behind these AI systems and start looking at how invisible workers play a key role behind AI systems. The first one that we'll discuss is the AI systems for Web 2.0 and other industries. Now, to begin with, invisible labor has long existed, but what we are seeing with ICT and with digital technologies is that there is a new category of invisible work, which is emerging, and this is human labor behind technology also human in the loop processes, which are not visible to technology consumers. So we have Gary and Suri who call this ghost work, which is fueling a revolution in artificial intelligence through millions of people carrying out billions of small tasks. This is not exaggerated and I'll come to it in a bit. Now they give a very interesting example of Fei Fei Li who back in the day wanted to train machines to recognize mean objects in an image. To begin with, this needed a lot of training data. So what did they do? They wrote a software to download millions of images from the World Wide Web, hired an undergraduate team to label each image. So this team, like temp workers, uh, they would sit down and label each image. And then they calculated and extrapolated that it would take 19 years for this team to reach the place where they wanted to with regard to label data. So then they tried to develop a machine learning algorithm. But the very fact that to begin with, there was a need to label data by humans, this machine learning algorithm started giving errors and it could not do the task that was needed. 
Eventually, in 2007, their team discovered Amazon Mechanical Turk. What this allowed them to do was to disperse automatically these images for labeling to workers across the world to train AI. Ultimately, they used 49,000 workers from 167 countries to accurately label 3.2 million images. Now, this was in 2007. Today, there is an interesting example from Scale, which is just one company providing this service, which claims that just up till this point, they have uh, annotated 7.7 .7 billion images and labeled, two, uh, labeled 1 billion uh, 2D and 3D scenes. So this is the amount of human labor, energy, emissions, investment going into labeling data, annotating data, so that we can automate, in quotes, certain systems so that I can summarize an article faster. Now, how are these invisible workers supplied? Um, you, you have the situation of Microsoft's platforms. There are several platforms where workers undertake annotation work. They also do data entry through globally dispersed workforce. Workers are classified by such platforms as independent contractors, often lacking basic labor protections. There are also situations of call centers and contact centers where annotation is done through in-house workforce. Sometimes they're also supported by software products, which allows humans to do annotation a bit more efficiently. And then there is the case of internal platforms of tech companies where they outsource to third party vendor management systems. So we have the example of EWOQ by Google, which, uh, which is an internal platform of the, of the company, which is used for cleaning and uh, for training, uh, for use, cleaning data for training purposes. And then there is the case of content moderation, moderation where you have microtask platforms, call centers, all being used. Workers in such situations often are based in developing countries. Now to delve deeper and looking at uh, training AI data for autonomous vehicles, this is an interesting example from scale of how an automotive data engine is developed. This includes data labeling, then data curation, which means using that data, using different kinds of data for different scenarios, and then model evaluation, where the checks and tests undertaken by workers. In all these processes, there's a worker involved. There's something very revealing about this model. It's a loop. It's infinite. It is never ending because we have not reached a state where things are fully automated and workers always need to be plugged in for the so-called autonomous vehicles. And how do these vehicles become autonomous? So they rely on machine learning algorithms that require large raw data sets. Raw data sets can be an image, they can be a video, audio, text, which is then annotated through tools specifically designed for data annotation purposes. So if you look at the first image above, you see that could be a raw data where then workers will be labeling each and every artifact in that image, whether it is the tree, the road, or the car, or the pedestrian. So aut autonomous vehicle manufacturers outsource these tasks to platforms like Appen or Scale for image classification, object or landmark detection, or tagging. You have images of pedestrians, dogs, traffic lights, and so on and so forth, which are then specifically tagged. And another case is that of bound box, bounding box, which is the second image on the slide, where a worker draws a box on each object within an image, and this image could be 2D or 3D. So data annotators then transform the raw data into training data that is then encoded into machine learning model. But you don't have to believe me for this. You can see a video by a company that offers the service on how work is undertaken with regard to these. Operated by a human being. Can you get that?
I understand that I was not audible for people who are attending online. So just to sort of repeat that, you see these the, the cursor there represented a worker who's performing these tasks. And some of these tasks can be called with very fancy names, but essentially it's it's drawing an outline on a car. And these are highly educated workers performing this kind of task in developing countries where their human resources could be used for something far more productive. Moving forward, uh, the, we have more examples of categorization, landmarking, and polygons. So categorization, what Uma already mentioned, when we look at an e-commerce e website, you know, products pop up, but there's a human being behind that who's selecting, who, who's being presented with an image, and then th that human being is selecting shoes, or wh what kind of shoes they are, boots, are they for a, a, a male or a female, and that kind of categorization is happening at the back end. Similarly, facial recognition, which has been gaining a lot of popularity, uh, human beings are landmarking, so they are they're plotting characteristics in the data, such as eyes, nose, to train these facial recognition systems. And then we have the case of polygon because a lot of objects are not that clear cut to identify. So the highest vertices dot by dot are being identified a human being so that AI can be trained. And this can then be used for say vehicles, but gaming, but several other industries are using this kind of data. Um, moving forward is, is the example of content moderation, which is basically supporting our entire web right now, whether we use Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, we don't see pornography, we don't see violent content, it's because somebody at the back end is cleaning it for us. And these people are often, these workers are often in, um, in developing countries. Now, for the longest time, there were claims that, oh, this entire content moderation system has been automated and AI is going to do the tasks. But uh, it, it's quite revealing that uh, when companies like Google publish their transparency report, which they are now obligated under the EU Digital Services Act, you see that human reviewers or content moderators play a key role in content, on content moderation. YouTube, for instance, which is a Google product, uh, Automated systems may flag initially some problematic content, but it is at the end of the day, which hum it's humans who have to go through it, review it, and then decide whether it should be taken down or not. And they give a very clear example. Algorithms cannot even tell the difference between terrorist propaganda and human rights footage. So this is the level at which automation is right now. And hence humans remain very, very relevant in content moderation. What we're also seeing uh, in our research uh, in, in the ILO flagship report is that big tech companies have been outsourcing content moderation to BPOs in developing countries. And this is often advertised as a part of a CSR initiative that we are helping the country by getting this kind of work. And there is a degree of internalization which is happening as well. So you have some BPO companies in India which would say, we are acting as a firewall or a gatekeeper or a watchdog of the internet. So there is this zeal of protecting the internet. But at the end of the day, this is a lot of digital trash being sent to developing countries, digital trash often also emerging from the global north. And we also found in, in the case of one BPO that 90% of the workers undertaking content moderation tasks are graduates or postgraduates with engineering and computer science skills. And what are they doing, which our research and other research has also shown, they're watching content involving pornography, assault, animal abuse, life, suicide, so on and so forth, with serious psychological implications, some also suffering from PTSD. There is a documentary which was released in 2018 about such cleaners, the workers who are cleaning up the internet, and a worker there says that I have seen hundreds of beheadings. This would, of course, have major psychological impacts. The other frontier which is opening up with regard to content moderation is with chat GPT, because again, workers are addressing toxicity issues in uh, these uh, large language models, which initially, uh, when they, they came out over the past year and gained popularity, there have been these fears that they will replace knowledge workers or they will augment work or they will replace routine rep repetitive tasks. But again, a bit of excavating behind the algorithms behind chat GPT, we see that there is human verification, which plays a key role for accountability of these. And Times did a fantastic expose of Kenyan workers used to address toxicity issues on related to violence, sexist, and racist responses, all the while paying $2 an hour for filtering toxic content while the workers suffered traumatic experiences. So this is again with, pro, portrayed as fully automated, whereas all this large workforce is in the back end of even ChatGPT. Recently, Gemini, a, a competitor of ChatGPT from Google, had to pause its operations because it was giving outcomes which were biased and potentially racist. And the immediate response was, oh, we will need human in the deep process to address this. 
Similarly, a policy manager of OpenAI just this month explained in a blog that human in the loop oversight will remain vital for such activities on, on this kind of large language models. And simply altering the training data or changing one or two pieces of code will not address this problem. It will constantly need human supervision. The next type of AI that uh, we would like to highlight uh, are the, the AI which are driving consumer products, such as robot vacuum cleaners. Now, they've, they've gained, such products have been gaining some popularity, but again, when we look behind the scenes, we see that uh, a microworker in Brazil spent two days moving her dog's poop and taking more than 250 photographs in a home so as to generate training data for a vacuum cleaner to avoid excrements. Uh, this was a study uh, that we've sh shown below. Uh, it, 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 was, it, it was captured in this study. And it, it's amazing that such highly expensive products, which, are, which can only be accessed by a few consumers, require this kind of work being put in. But the story doesn't end here. It, the, the plot thickens because when when we see such products, now we, it's not just the vacuum cleaner. We have uh, a virtual assistants of uh, like Alexa, and we have other devices, smart devices, which are recording us, our audios, our videos, uh, our images. But then this, all this data, all this information is dispersed in a global AI supply chain. Consumers often don't fully understand the implications of using this kind of devices and how their data is being used. And this is a case of a Roomba, again, an automated uh, vacuum cleaner, which recorded a woman on the toilet. And then the screenshots ended up in a Facebook group, which were accessed by MIT Technology Review. So these, these images there are shown, uh, were, were picked up by a Roomba. And this, Th these images are being used for training AI in such industrial and consumer products, where because workers are then labeling, tagging, further training, and this infinite loop carries on. Passing it back on to Uma to take it forward. Yeah, thanks a lot, Trisha. Uh, we have two other types of AI that we want to talk about. One is the virtual assistant AI powered tool for secretarial services. And this is a very interesting story where I had an interview with uh, the name has changed and uh, it's not revealed. And I interviewed this person over three days to get the entire story out to even understand what was happening behind it. Because those were the early days of my understanding what AI development was happening, what was behind the scenes, how human in the loop works. And so it was quite fascinating. So this was a startup that started in 2014. And the idea behind it was to have scheduling services that coordinates for companies, you know, how and when and where uh, you can actually organize the interviews, but also provide secretarial services to its staff saying, if I want to have a particular appointment, say with Simon, I can say to that particular tool saying, I want to meet Simon at such and such pace, at such and such time, and can you organize it? So that's what the tool was supposed to be doing. And there was an email ID that was being provided, and the promise was this task will be done in less than 45 minutes, and there were a number of subscription packages that were there from $99 to $399 that uh, the clients could take, and depending upon the offer, you had a number of other services that were there. Now, when the entire startup was set up in 2014, all they had to do was write up a proposal, a one-page proposal saying, this is a secretarial service, this is what it will provide. There was absolutely no verification, no auditing, no checking that was done. At the first instant, they got $11 million as an investment from venture capitalists. How did the entire story start? It's not that there was any AI. There were three people living in an apartment, in one room apartment in San Francisco. And all they were doing was they were getting these messages from the different clients whom they had sold these subscription packages. And they were actually themselves doing all the appointments. There's no AI. It's just humans. No human in the loop. It's just there's an email ID. And that's done by three people. During that process, they didn't even have an idea of what kind of a model would be needed. 
And then they started, they got a computer scientist and then they started getting certain terms to flag it, to loop it and try to see how that could be captured from the males. Now, all of us write males very differently. We have our own idiosyncrasies. So it's very, very different for natural language processing uh, models to actually capture all these idiosyncrasies. Now, it's possible to an extent, but the accuracy is nowhere there. So they, what they started as exclusively human-driven, they then did a hybrid of human-machine interaction by hiring workers on a number of micro tasks and freelance platforms and actually getting them to reply to these mails. And over a period of time, they now had have workers in about 12 countries whom they hire and whom actually do the job while the entire human machine interaction is going on. Now, the particular firm was sold. And you know, before I had the interview, it was just called as a human, uh, it was called as an AI power tool. And after the entire interview was done, and I said, well, there's so much of humans behind it. I saw that in no time they changed the entire setup and they said, humans behind the AI powered tool. And that was interesting to see that they suddenly realized this was an ILO person talking to them. I said, very good. But I think what was shocking was even without it being an AI tool in 2019, they sold it for $345 million. I think this is what is gross about the kind of AI technologies we are talking about. And I call this deceptive AI. And it's largely because natural language processing are nowhere there. So we can even not go and say that, you know, all of this is powered. There's also a larger question that we need to ask, do we need really a tool like that? That's something that we would get into a discussion. So this kind of a deceptive AI, faking it with pseudo AI, is not just with virtual assistants. Some people have revealed now, Spinbox did it in 2008, that it was converting voicemails into text messages rather than using machines uh, uh, and that they use call centers. XAI and Clara, which are two other companies under virtual assistants have also revealed that humans were behind what was being pretended as chatbots for a calendar scheduling. And in 2017, Expensify came up saying that, well, all these transcription of receipts were being done, not by an app, but by workers on platforms. So, you know, how much of humans are behind those bots is something we really, really need to look at and not take everything for AI. The fourth is the most shocking for me. This is the automated surveillance or security systems. This was again done by colleagues at the Dip Lab through their work in Madagascar. So to just tell you a short story behind it, you have security systems in supermarkets in France, and a lot of these products are being sold. And you'll be just shocked to hear that there's no AI behind it. The way this entire system works is the AI tool is sold, but there's a call center in Madagascar where the workers are sitting and there are cameras that are attached to the security uh, to the security system in the supermarket. And what they do is a team there, this is not the only job, they do a number of other things, but in between that, they monitor remotely the French supermarkets and then if they find somebody stealing, all they do is send a message to the manager and you find the culprit and you put them behind the bars. So where is AI? That's one of the biggest questions that we really want to ask as when we get into this. Now, this one, because also there's so much of talk about AI deployment and what needs to be done. And I think there are stories behind the scenes that needs to be taken far more seriously by uh, different organizations, but also by the governments and by the society at large. Now you see two end of the AI map in a way. You have the software programmers, coders, developers who build large machine learning models, very well paid sometimes, sometimes not if they are part of the freelancer community or coder community on talent or competitive programming platforms. 
But to run those models, which are never accurate, which keep changing, which keep builds, building on itself, you really need large army of invisible workforce who prepares, who annotates, who verifies, who are part of the large value chain process. So this myth that exists that data needs are not infinite, but finite to sustain AI systems is something very much to think about because this is not going away. And what you also see is that these AI companies are largely based in Global North, while the workers are largely in the Global South. This has huge implications for labor. It's displacement of labor for certain activities like secretarial services, but they move from formal work to piece rate work. There's a big cushion from a development point of view where with regard to what happens to skills and education of people. I raise this largely because, you know, I'm from the generation who studied development economics in India, where the silver bullet for me was get good education, you'll be part of the formal labor market. You'll have labor protections, social protections. So we, at a young age of six, are pushed in our households to actually study well, be on the top and get into the best of the universities and uh, technology institutes so that we can make a difference in our life. But what we see with the job opportunities coming into these labor markets is a bit shocking. And I'll also talk about some of the working conditions there. So to do a quick uh, run about whom are we talking about, you all must be wondering who are these invisible workers that you know, Risha and Uma have been talking all this while about. The global survey shows, which we did in 2017, much of this is based on the work ILO has been doing since 2017 to 2023. And when we did the global survey of about more than 120 countries, we found that the average age was 33 years of these workers, just the AI workers. And in developing countries, it was 31 years. And one out of three workers who were doing this task was women. It was a bit high in developing countries, largely reside in urban suburban communities. But we find from our country studies that this is becoming a rural area phenomena increasingly. The country surveys that were done recently showed that the average age is far more lower. It's 27, 25 years, which means that people who are entering the labor market are getting into this kind of work. And even in the BPO industry, the age is far lower. Now, this is something that I do want to spend a few minutes to show you what we have been talking about. Now, the education levels of most of these workers, and this especially in the developing countries, was about more than 80% have a postgraduate or bachelor's degree. I think that's just not alone the point. The point is, what are they trained in? And I think in these countries where STEM education is something very, very important, to see how do you bring about a transformation within the economy and the society, you find that 58% of them in medicine, natural sciences, IT and computers, all they're doing is either doing image annotation, content moderation, data collection, data tagging. So you know the question is, how does it help them individually, their economies, their societies. What is even more shocking is many of these workers are promised that they will become data analysts and data analytics. But this is not the story. There's absolutely no progress for many of these workers after a period of time. And we find similar trends coming out from the country surveys. Now, these are the tasks that are being performed. And if you look at the average and the median hourly earnings in the global survey, you find that it is $2 mean. And if you look at the median, that is how much does the 50th or the 50% of the workers earn? They earn less than $1.2 per hour. This is half of what even Perigo actually found out. When you get down to country surveys, it's there are two things that come out super shocking. One is not only, and I think uh, one thing I would like to also mention is we look at both the paid time and the unpaid time. Unpaid time, if you want to know, is people who spend time looking for work 
or doing work that gets rejected or work that is just not accepted and not paid. So if you include all of that, your earnings actually go down. Now the two things from here for India where we have been able to do a resurvey, we found that paid earnings or even the total earnings over a period of time do not really increase. And even then it's only about $2 per hour. Now, one of the arguments that is there, and I think I'm a bit tired of trying to tell people that, guys, things are not so hunky-dory nice in the BPO companies. There's often this notion that, oh, BPOs are good. They protect the workers. You have labor protection. You have social protection. There's a stability and all of it. We did a survey of the BPO companies uh, as part of the India report recently. And I show you the monthly earnings and I show you the hourly earnings. And what I did for the hourly earnings is actually I divided the monthly earnings by only 25 days, not by 30 days. If I do it by 30 days, it will be far lower. So when I said, okay, let's go by 25 days. And if you do it by 25 days, you find that irrespective of whether you're a data annotator, content moderator, or quality analyst, your hourly earnings are lower than what a micro task worker in India on these platforms actually earns. So this is for me was one of the most shocking news, uh, shocking figures that I saw. And this is consistent because I found the same in Kenya where we've been running surveys and we have done recently both the micro task platform and BPO for AI training and annotation. And you find that there, it is less than a dollar earning per hour that they have. Now, this is so whether you're talking about microtask or whether you're talking about BPOs. And there are differences between men and women, but they're not really huge differences, as you see. I think the other point that is there is the social security benefits. Now, many of these workers, as Risha pointed out, on microtask platforms, are classified as independent contractors. So globally, we do not see them getting any type of a social security coverage. And even if there is a coverage, this is largely because of either their other family members or other jobs. But you would expect that BBO companies would actually pay, right? Because some of them are also contact companies. But here you find that many of these BPO workers also do not get benefited from it. Now, there are a number of moral and ethical considerations that are there. Now, this AI development that is being supported by invisible workers with poor working conditions are creating sweatshop of educated digital labor. There's a huge issue around toxic. Uh, content being, uh, you know, cleaned by invisible workers who have huge psychological impacts. And recently, even unions uh, for, of alphabet workers actually went about raising issues about a cannery in the coal mine. I sort of really liked that concept that they had used. But there are also larger moral ethical issues around chat GPT and open AI about the use of copyrighted materials and how they are actually trying to get material within their entire large language learning model. Many of them use subscription models, but they also, as the workers or users have subscriptions, they also put copyrighted material onto it. So there are larger questions here that we need to deal with, and I'm not gonna to get too detailed into it. The sad part of it is also that many of those AI for, uh, stories that we are seeing in the name of development are entering rural areas and they're targeting rural workers with a narrative of addressing poverty, achieve, achieving sustainable development. And I want to just end with two more slides. One is about what all of this means for structural transformation or societal development. You know, when we think about technology, we think about how we make progress, how we bring about a change and how there would be a productive transformation. Now, none of what I have told you, I see any progress for workers in the developing countries. They do enhance productivity for some works and workers in global North and South, but what it creates is new kinds of exploitation and new kinds of polarizations and inequality. The larger question is, what does all this mean for development, both economic and social? What are the diffusion and spillover effects of all of this, especially when you're talking about image annotation, all of that work that Rishabh was showing, what does it mean for me as a worker in my country? How does it actually impact? 
how, what do I contribute for it? And do we really see a reallocation of labor? We don't really see. What we see is a shift of highly educated workers to a low end, low skill services sectors instead of high skill services or manufacturing sector. Moving forward, I do want to leave you with these thoughts and these questions. One is, do we want to promote this type of AI development? Yes, we need very clearly to regulate platform work and ensure decent work in the BPO sector, but is that all alone? Don't we need to start thinking about auditing AI firms for ethical AI development or deceptive AI? What is being sold as AI tools? Can we stop that so that we don't exploit these workers? And I think more importantly, as an ILO, we need to look for employment policies which links with innovation and technology to bring about that actually a meaningful structural transformation, creating meaningful jobs. How do we ensure education still remains the silver bullet for productive transformation of economies? And with this, I'll stop. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Uma and Rishab, for a, a very thought-provoking, challenging presentation in terms of uh, the, the uh, AI workers behind that curtain. You've lifted the veil on, on a range of issues. So now we have some time, um, almost uh, well, 40 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I'll start with the, the two that have been posted in the Q&A and, and online, so digital first, of course. But here we have some colleagues in the room, so please put up your hands. So let me, so as I'm, do, do put up your hands as, as I move uh, from these Q&A online. But uh, let me start with the first one that was posted by uh, anonymous attendee. Um, could this kind of tedious work and labeling be seen as an investment into opening up possibilities in the future. And you know, coming to many of those issues, neo colonialist considerations aside. It's also a very thought provoking question. A second question by Ivan Williams Yemenes. Uh, many thanks for presentation. Um, you know, need for stronger due diligence and early stage venture investments, uh, et cetera. To this, to this extent, do you find any good examples? of responsible investment that took care of the needs of these invisible workers. So these are two questions that we have that have been posted um, and, and we'll continue to check whatever else has been put on the, in the chat. But let me just, before Hanny, you know, we'll take a couple of rounds. So uh, let's, you got those two. Anyone else from the floor here want to, to add to the discussion? It's Maria. Short questions are welcome. <laughs> Uh, so I have a question concerning uh, those invisible workers. You have some data, I mean, age, et cetera. How were you able to, to get that information? Uh, because it seems a bit uh, difficult to, to get that. And I don't know if I saw correctly, but a lot of the data was developing countries uh, invisible workers in developing countries contributing to this hidden artificial intelligence used maybe elsewhere. Uh, and uh, how, is there, uh, are there also invisible workers in developed economies? Sorry about that. Thanks a lot for a very stimulating presentation on something that I think few of us know much about. I have two, therefore, rather elementary questions. Um, to what extent is, is this very unpalatable uh, spread of uh, educated sweatshop work a temporary phenomenon to be displaced itself by AI as algorithms progress? Uh, that's, that's one question. The second question is really, you know, Uma and Rishab, uh, you know, in, I'm thinking about India or the Philippines and places like that. Why do graduates and postgraduates take this work on? 
I think, Uma, you alluded to the fact that they're promised something else. They're promised a career progression. Is that common? Uh, hasn't the word gotten around that this is basically lousy work? Uh, and the more pregnant question is, are there alternatives for postgrads and graduates in the developing countries that take uh, that uh, where these work is taken on? Thanks. Sorry, let's enter this round. We've got more in the in the audience and online, so we'll have more than two or three rounds yeah. ahead. As well. I'll reply and then give it to you, uh, Risham. Okay, uh, to the anonymous question on tedious work, neo-colonialist consideration, I don't want to jump in there. I think there's quite a bit of academic literature that is there, which goes around trying to link uh, you know, the French AI development systems to the French colonies, because that's how it's been going. And some of the US to Philippines and to India and other countries. I think uh, the, ju the judgment is out there, but you know what the companies are today doing is it's not necessarily part of it could be the colonialist rules and you can get into the no neo-colonialist kind of an idea. But much of it is related to how can we get this AI running using any kind of a cheap labor? I think that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter then whether you use platforms, whether you use BPO companies, what you do. But what we need is huge data training material. So we'll do whatever we want. But I think we have to really re-look and see to what extent you know, some of these narratives get further, uh, you know, uh, built into a very strong commitments in a way. Now, Ivan, I, I cannot but, and that's what I meant by saying, auditing of companies. I think very clearly we need very strong due diligence right at the time of investment into these AI tools and products. And I think there's absolutely no process and I think this is something we keep talking in the context of Uber largely that, you know, the uh, there's so many companies that are competing, but by the end of the day, there will be one winner, winner takes all kind of an argument. And I think that kind of an argument also exists for AI tools and products and services where there is a hope that tomorrow this would be the tool that would go about uh, doing the task or replacing workers or something, but as of now, it's not there. And you are able to exploit the labor because you also have these platforms that have come in, which allow you to have access to the global 24-7 labor force around the world who are willing to do it free of task. Because what I have not told you is that on many of the platforms, when you try to have an account and try to get access to work, you have to do a lot of free work to be able to have a rating, which then allows you to have access to it. So why should I not try? Why should not investors are willing to give money? Why not try some of this? If it doesn't work, that's fine. I sell and go, which is exactly what's been happening. And that's what is problematic. And that's what also needs uh, some sort of a governance mechanisms to say, you know, what can move and what should not be done within the societies. Now, Maria's question about this is all developing. Do we see it in develop? Uh, there's a bit of it happening in developed countries. Our global survey did show that was uh, there, but the percentage of workers into the AI training is far less. There are certain pockets within the US and even within Europe where some of this work is done. But if you start digging a bit more deeper, and there are some people who have started to look at it, it's refugee populations or those in the minorities who are actually doing that within these countries. And it's not necessarily the native populations in a way who are doing. Duncan, very, very important question. Actually, uh, if you see the film, uh, the documentary film uh, Cleaners, and this was something I used to say even before that, because uh, for me, when I started working on the micro task and started looking at it, one of the things that struck me when I looked at the content moderation was, again, not again, it's the global South workers cleaning the trash of the global North. And this woman actually in uh, cleaners because that's based in Philippines uh, and they went about interviewing a number of workers in a BPO company. 
this woman who used to live next to a garbage dump in a, in a slum, her mother said when she was young that you better study, otherwise you would end up picking the garbage from the garbage dump. And she says, I did my post-graduation. What am I doing today? I'm cleaning the garbage on the web. So that's what it captures. And the question is, why is that happening? The reason why that is happening is the mainstream narrative has gone about selling platforms and AI development models as a new generation of creating employment opportunities. That's the silver bullet. So all developing countries are now putting a lot of investments into digital infrastructure. And then they are trying to say, okay, we have an issue of employment. Here's the employment, let's do that. So, you know, what we need to really do is think about what is the kind of employment policy we need and how can we actually generate these jobs? And I think that's fundamental and most important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very, very quickly, I don't have much to add. Just on the VC venture capital question that was brought about, indeed, there is a lot of need for due diligence and it's a very opaque system, the whole venture capital investments, because you may have venture capitalists investing in competing companies hedging their bets who is going to be the winner who takes it all and picking up on what uh, duncan had sort of inquired we 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 have a we there was a recently a quote from a major industrialist in india who owns uh, large industries from ports to technology who said that it's a great opportunity for India to emerge as the back office for AI. So this discourse is very clearly developing. And as the ILO, I think it's also important for us to reflect on whether or not this is a social justice question. Should developing countries be cleaning the trash, digital trash of the, the global north all the time? And should workers with such education being, be doing this kind of work? This is also very much a social justice question as well in the process. Great. No, thanks. Thanks, Umar, Rishab. There's lots of questions coming in. Uh, so we'll try to keep the responses a bit shorter because uh, there's some excellent questions coming in. I know there's a few more from the floor. So let's first take Masi. And then one here. Um, okay, I think Jao and a colleague in front. And then I'll, I'll turn to some of the questions that have been posted. But we'll take this round and do put up your hands for others who, who would like to come in. So Masi, please. Yes. But Thank you. First of all, I had the same question, Duncan, and uh, thank you for answering that. But I have, a, I have a secondary question. So, of course, we, it's very hard to judge what is the so social value of AI as a product that was, but sometimes we, we're wondering, okay, do I need, uh, um, I mean, maybe when I Google, I search for a dog, uh, I find a dog uh, that's very useful, yes, for sure. But what has been also the uh, social value at the applications. Uh, we've seen some applications now. Besides the fact that, of course, uh, is that there is uh, what what is the um, demanded by the market is just who has a purchasing power. So there might be some high end consumers that like that. So, but it would be interesting to to weigh the cost with the social value. Thank you.
All right. <laughs> okay. That's uh, um, but you know, and and there was another question about how, you know from 2016, 17, have things changed? And that was a question I had as well. You know, from the early those early days, have the the processes and the use of these hidden workers changed over the you know the last few years? Um, and you know how how has that impacted um, the issues that you've been raising? Whether the most recent uh, surveys indicate in, in, any improvement and. You know, linked to that, there's been a lot of questions. You, you know, talked about the auditing part, but you know whether there's you know good examples of those who are doing due diligence. Com there are companies who are trying to address this. Uh, are there any examples of where these issues are being tackled through, either from investor side, due diligence side, but also in terms of the ethical practices of of um, you know the diff businesses in the different part of this uh, ultimately um, you know value chain. Um, and, and there, there were also questions on safety and health challenges. A number of people asking about what are the safety and health challenges. I mean, you referred to being exposed to some of these very confronting images. You know, and I actually, I, I, in, on this point, I, I'm not sure if people saw the article in the Financial Times of, uh, just under two months ago by David Pilling, from, who's the Africa editor. And as I think I uh, said to Uma, he must have been reading your work because, I mean, this is the Financial Times, a very respected journalist, um, and, and as, it, as a tagline goes there, you know, they were lured by the promise of jobs at the cutting edge of AI, and they ended up in a battle for their rights. And he explains very much also about those issues around the effects on the health of those content moderators and, and taggers. So, you know, so there's gone through a couple of issues there. I hope you, you, you saw that. I mean, in terms of, um, uh, you know, differences today, uh, what has changed, the occupational safety and health. Um, and, and there are a few other issues there still to, to get to, but let me see um, if you want to add. And if anyone else, anyone else from the floor wants to add? Okay, so let, let's take those issues. I mean, there are big issues as well. So, and we still have time to go back to others that uh, uh, have been posting as well. Yeah, Rishabh, just please. to sort of address the issue of uh, of training and eventually reaching a point where things start happening on their own is a question which also came up. Now, if you look at the example of Facebook, it's been around for 20 years now. It's it's not like Chat GPT, which is two, three years. It's 20 years that it's been around. And during those 20 years, there have been several claims that things will be automated, automated, automated. Yet, even now, the recent transparency report 2023, which they submitted, it again says it's a combination of automation and workers. So at the end of the day, decisions are being take by, taken by workers, despite all the training which is going into uh, the content moderation algorithms and whatnot. So we are just not there, despite 20 years of data input, despite 20 years of training the data. So this, this, this situation remains, and it became, becomes extremely problematic. And also with regard to safety and health, um, in an expose, again, a large tech company working with the um, contractors through BPOs, where it's revealed that workers are working in horrible conditions, that they are facing several traumatic uh, challenges, occupational and safety health issues. And that company in that interview says that actually it's the responsibility of the BPO company we have outsourced it. So this, this passing the buck then also is happening in this AI supply chain. So that's something to be mindful of. Pass it on to me. Thanks a lot, Trisha. About the good example of due diligence that you were talking about, uh, that was being asked, I think uh, Fair Work is trying to actually also look into the AI issues now. So they have been following up uh, SAMA, one of the companies, US-based companies, which operates in Kenya, which goes about saying ethical AI. And it's an ethical AI company, not because... Uh, it is trying to look into the issues of saying that content moderation is not done or things like that are not done, but it is much more about be ethically pay workers kind of a thing. So they try to get to the five fair work principles that are there. But their recent uh, uh, analysis very clearly shows that even Sama, which talks about, it talks itself being an ethical AI company, doesn't even meet any of the working conditions requirement that is there, which is really very basic, basic minimum. I think uh, that takes me to the whole question about uh, occupation safety and health. 
and the challenges that are there and also about the regulations regarding that and you know often one of the solutions that is given is that oh let's pay the minimum wages and let's have a psychologist and or a psychiatrist in the company and that would help help the problem i think looking at it and looking coming from a developing country i really ask the question that minimum wages in many of these countries having worked on it for a decade or so myself is really at the lowest lowest end that is even below what a domestic worker would even get so trying to get that minimum wage that never gets revised even for the standard of living is actually not a meaningful way to look at it and the second question is these workers are very highly skilled workers they as you saw they have stem education now if you want to really get this ai work done and that it has a social value that it helps promote bring about an economic productive transformation then give them triple the amount of money that that particular occupation should be getting and then you can go about training i think that's a cost that you need to put on getting any ai tool developed it cannot come at the cost of exploiting workers and i think that's something that's important second issue about psychological well being remember that many of these workers sign an nda they cannot share it with their families they cannot share it with their friends so it's all pumped into the system having a psychiatrist cannot help the brains are affected and what is the societal value that you get as a result of it you get a lot of people who are in a very sad state of affairs and i think this is something we need to really think about great thanks so i'm going to go to another set of questions from the online q and a uh, is anybody here want to jump in nobody nobody okay so there are another set of questions that look at uh, at at the workers themselves um one is about migration status and whether this undermines protection for workers in these digital supply chains and a second question we um, undermines the 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 their, their protections oh. the protection for these workers you know depending on their migration status are they migrant workers now there's a, a another question that is broader it's got looking at you know their backgrounds and you know the question is are invisible workers across different backgrounds particularly from developing countries represented in the ai development um and how can they be achieved in ensuring ethical ai development um it's it's so i you know i think reading into that question is about the different types of workers uh, of different backgrounds you talked about the education profile because you know potentially there are opportunities as well but I'll, you know for other types of workers uh, i'm reading into the question that's not what uh, the person had written but also but they do also refer to you know there's a large unemployment pool in developing countries especially in africa and how can this be addressed given that there is an opportunity to, to exploit them or a risk of exploiting them rather so there's there's a broader question about their backgrounds and finally i would like to add then this issue about skills and and you mentioned it about the, as as I also just referred to about the education profile um but because the the online uh post a q and question is referring to the fact that employers are often saying that employment graduates don't have the necessary skills for the rapidly changing world of work um i mean do you what do you consider the, their claims valid and the, at the same time you know they they're using a lot of these high highly educated people in these tasks um so there is a mismatch there but there are also many employers rightly so in many contexts are referring to mismatches they face in the labor market and you know in terms of the value of education you had referred to in your presentation there are three sets of issues around this you know the nature the background of these workers their migration status the link to skills and education that are there i think um which um we could get address now thanks yeah very clearly the migration what we see in many uh developing countries especially when it's within the continents that you've seen like i think in latin america we have seen a lot of venezuelan workers going to a number of other countries and then one of the first jobs that they can have 
uh, because they can't just get integrated into the labor market easily. So one of the first jobs that they get into is either doing some other kinds of taxi delivery, but then you get to see, be seen. So they get on to this kind of a micro task work so as to get some money. Now, of course, there's absolutely no labor protections there or any kind of other protections that you get. So that's systematically what we see. And also what you see is today, uh, it's that kind of a migration, but also there's no need for workers to migrate, right? Earlier, before the entry of uh, this kind of a platform work, you might be outsourcing or insourcing workers to do this kind of work, but you don't need to do that today because you have the platform business model through which you can get a global workforce, which is all the time looking for work as there are not many opportunities that are there. So, you know, you can get get it down, raised to the bottom. Now, about the background that you're talking about, what we find, and that's what I showed in a couple of slides, is uh, many of these workers are from different uh, background profiles. They come from arts, they come from social sciences, humanities, but also other kinds of skills, which we call it as STEM skills. So it's not one background. Now, the question that comes up to you is, why are they all doing this job? And part of the reason has to do with not having employment opportunities in the labor market. I get your point, Cher, that you say, yes, employers are all the time complaining. We don't have skilled workers to do the task. Probably there's something that is happening in the labor market where we need to divert the highly skilled workers who are coming into these companies to go elsewhere where it's actually needed and, you know, do something which is more meaningful and productive for the economy. So there's something else that needs to be touched upon, and that could be social dialogue in a way. Let's have a discussion around it and see what needs to be done. What is the kind of industries that we need to develop? And where should we use our educated skill labor? And this is not new. Three decades ago, many developing countries did that, including my own country. Why have we missed it today? Why are we getting into a trajectory which is absolutely does not have a path to moving towards a productive transformation of our societies and economies? Right. Right. Well, is there a question? Further questions? Okay. There's a, now. There's another round. So okay, because we're just looking at the time. I was thinking we'll go into wrap up mode. But then, indeed, there's still time to squeeze in a few questions. So keep your questions short. I see. I think there's something else also online, but uh, I see uh, Pavel, uh, Martin, and Zulum. So you three, please, in that order, and then I'll look at what's online, and we'll be going to wrap up. Thank you. Pavel, thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, obviously. And the, it's, I think it's on. I need to come closer to it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just have, I wanted to come back again on that question that was, I think, initially raised by Duncan, because... I feel it hasn't come back that much as an answer as to the share of content moderation, for example, of data labeling that is done in an automated way. And that is really quickly uh, expanding from my understanding in, in very much domain dependent, right? So there are domains where just a few percentage of content moderation gets done by humans, the things that are gonna be, don't get picked up by a machine. By saying that, I'm not trying to say that this makes the work of these humans better. It actually makes it worse because that means whatever the algorithm doesn't catch goes to the humans and that's usually worse. So for example, pornographic content that's not caught by an algorithm goes to the humans to, to, to later label. But I have a feeling that the way you presented it from the beginning is as only humans do that work. And I have a feeling that has changed from 2016, 17, when you were collecting some of the data you're showing and today, quite a lot of that process is done automatically. And the progress in that area is very fast in terms of generation of synthetic data for training of models as well. There are some really interesting papers coming out on that as well. And the second part I wanted to challenge a little bit is that go back to the question that you asked, Uma, do we even need a tool like that? I have a feeling that when you pose that question, you're basically somewhat hinting to a proposal of hitting an emergency break and saying, well, could we just stop doing all of this? And I'd like to get more of your thoughts of that. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding the way you're posing that question. But I have a feeling that when we look at what is happening at the UN system, 
the discussions we will be having here on the 11th of March, you know, what the markets are doing, that's a little bit of a radical proposal. So I think that second side of auditing and governance issue is something that will be more sellable to the broader audience. And on the auditing, I'd like to ask more, when you mean auditing, do you think about it as a supply chain issue where you'd audit the end users? So let's say open AIs and the like, or are you talking about auditing of those BPOs? Because it's a supply chain and you could put that auditing at different areas of the supply chain. What, what are you thinking about when you mentioned it? Well, just, yeah, but sure you can. I just will need to take a, the, cause I, given the time I'll need to, I mean, they are very big, important questions, but Martin and then Zulum. Um, uh, just a very quick question. Thanks for the gender dimension of the, uh, I think it was very striking, you know, the, what you said about how this affects actually women workers in developing countries. The question is um, on the regulatory model, you know, international labor standards are meant to be applied by ILO members within their jurisdiction. You know, and it's based on borders that migration is regulated and it's like the system. The international system as we know it, the international legal system as well. So wouldn't that call for a more radical model for regulation, a bit like the Maritime Labor Convention, or should there be something like a minimum wage for, for the platform economy that is applied globally? How could that be regulated? Um, no, thanks. Uh, that's another small question to tackle, but uh, Zulum? Yes, no, just uh, more than a question is just to kind of bring into the table more aspects that I believe we need to consider too in this very interesting debate. There are so many angles and one is connected to the comment our colleague just made because uh, I have the impression that we need to um, understand better the difference in between cloud-based and location-based work. Because most of the advances in regulation had been done in location-based work just precisely because they are easy to identify within national territory. And we have been trying to look for examples that are a little bit more national uh, driven by national authorities on, on cloud-based and there is really mm, almost nothing. It's, it's really a challenge. Uh, um, and well, also perhaps uh, a suggestion, and because we will have the 2025 discussion and many other debates in between, uh, I think that the other um, dimension or other view in this um, debate is that one of platforms. Some, some of them really consider their business as a supply chain and are doing some efforts in trying to regulate. And I think that is where we can find a point of understanding with some, although really has been extremely difficult to get to platforms, especially those ones that do not have this type of uh, um, a ethical behavior or at least intention to do something. So, um, and then the other, the other big dimension I would like to bring in the sense of social justice and and uh, inclusiveness and um, also uh, uh, the agenda for productive work is that uh, these new technologies are generating a, a new digital divide. No, the the prior the prior digital the prior digital divide was to access the internet. Now is to have the skills and also be able to use for your daily life, but also for working the new technology. So there are so many different aspects I think that Thanks. can be uh, discussed. But I guess that you are really making a good contribution to start all this debate and bringing. Uh, uh, I, I hope that we can bring Thanks. the different efforts from different colleagues working uh, from different perspectives because it's Thanks. really important to develop that what you are proposing in the in the slide. So over and thank you. Sorry, thanks. We're almost out of time, and some very big, important questions have been. So do, but do try to keep them the answers as, as focused as possible. I will start losing too many people online. I know it's hard to keep people beyond one and a half hours, but these are very important issues. So, and this is so this is also a wrap up, right? So this will be the last interventions from both of you. So how would you? Okay. Um, uh, uh, Rishabh, you can start and, and I'll then, take yeah. in. Thanks. Just a quick short focus. intervention to uh, address Powell's comment on content moderation. Uh, 
a lot of the discussion on that is not from 2007-16. It's a 2023 report, not by academics, not by journalists, by the tech company itself, which says algorithms cannot distinguish between human rights footage and terrorist propaganda. In the workflow, the first step may be red flagging automatically, but the second step is human intervention. So content moderation is very much a human driven process because algorithms are just not there yet in 2023 in their transparency report across Google products. So it's quite interesting to see that. So we are very far from the sense of automation. Just on that, I'll leave the rest to you. Thank you so much, very well said. And we're not trying to paint a picture that, you know, it's all humans. We never said that. We just said, how is AI developed? Where are humans there? And how humans are part and parcel of the loop for the language learning model to go? And how it's very important for us as officials here and as researchers to understand what goes into the process. And actually what you said reminds me of a 2017 YouTube CEO saying, 95% of our material, objectionable material are actually flagged automatically. But what he failed to say was, because a fine percent of it is not done, there's a lot of checking that happens. That's why you need millions of workers. I sort of answered Duncan, but I can come back to you both and say that the proportion of workers that is required for this entire language learning models is increasing in millions across the globe. And I see new destinations coming in. Indonesia is a new one that has joined the bandwagon. And in Africa, a lot of countries are being sold as part of their employment policy to set up uh, micro task platforms and companies and Zulum can actually watch for it because we stopped it in one of the countries from moving ahead. Now with regard to auditing, what I mean by auditing, what exactly? And just before that, do I ask the question, do we want to promote this type of AI development? And I talk about what types we talked about. We are not saying, I'm not saying put a you want chat GPT to go on, it can go on. I'm not saying pull, pull out a break. I'm asking a very fundamental question after showing you all the evidence. Is this the way we need to go? If a security system is being sold in the name of AI and there's no AI, but humans, do we want to allow such an AI security system to be sold? And that's where you need an audit to really say, what is AI? What is AI in a tool? How are you operating? How does it work? If it's completely automated, great, but how did you even do it? I think there are different stages of the life cycle of an AI development, which needs to be audited today, whether it's platforms, whether it's companies, whether it's the initial proposal itself when it's being put. So I think there are huge governance mechanisms there. Coming to your point on Martin about the global minimum wage, I, I, I really don't know whether that's a solution or that's something that is possible, but there's one thought that I do have. One is that, you know, there's a competition law that exists, which benchmarks, and this is a German competition law, which I really adore and love, which says that a price of a product cannot be below a certain benchmark, taking into consideration raw material, labor, and all of it. We have to start thinking about services benchmark and say that the labor cost cannot go down below a certain parameter. And then if you can think about having a global level wage, that would work. But thank you so much to all of you for all your questions. Well, thank you. And now we've Thank definitely you. run out of time. I, I'm definitely not going to try to summarize anything. A lot has been said. But to me, what is absolutely critical is to have this bigger perspective in terms of what are the implications for economies, for labor markets, for the creation of, of decent and productive employment. There's one hand opportunities for improving productivity and the spillover effects. But on the other hand, as we've heard today, many challenges in terms of the effects on the quality of employment, those risks, uh, uh, linked to, to wages, to social protection, to OSH, uh, uh, et cetera. And of course, you know, it's going to be critical to find that balance in the coming years. And, and obviously looking at regulation is is critical part of it, but it goes beyond specific regulations. It goes to the broad employment policy, I would argue. 
And a number of comments were there we didn't get to, but we're talking about the role of the Global Accelerator, that, of course, the platform discussions at the ILO. Yes, I mean, these things we will, will continue. And I think trying to have this dialogue is an absolute critical part of it. Having a balanced look, trying to bring the different pieces together is, is, the, is the task at hand. So thanks again, uh, Uma and Rishab, and to all of you here in the room and also online for a very interesting, challenging uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shay.